And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PrunnerCast. Yeah, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if we want to. Visit us online at printermedia.tv. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this special holiday edition of PrunnerCast with me, Dom Goucher, and him, Pete Williams. Happy uh, Christmas, car. Do you know, that could be actually the one of the first made-up words you've done for a while, Pete. I didn't make that up. It's off, um, oh, not Dawson's Creek. One of those, um, you know, Laguna Beach type shows. Yeah, you know I have no idea what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Good old. Uh, moving swiftly on. Um, <clears throat> okay, what, folks, what, this what's week... The, what's the Seinfeld version of that? Seinfeld. Nope, sorry. St- nope, still lost me. Chris McCarr. wasn't Didn't like Seinfeld make up a name that matched or, or moulded Christmas and Hanukkah together? I haven't said this for a while, but put the shovel down. Step away from the hole. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. Folks, this week um, we are right on the edge of, uh, of December, um, which universally is being known these days as holiday season. Um, Pete and I have just got back from America where uh, you folks have already uh, kind of kicked off your holiday season. You've had your Thanksgiving and your uh, the, the Christmas trees are starting to be put up and decorated already. So we thought we'd put together a bit of a holiday gift guide. Um, as you know, Pete and I are a bit of, uh, a, bit of a tech freaks between us. Um, we love all things shiny and gadgety, and uh, we also love things that make life easier for us all. So uh, we thought we'd kind of give you some recommendations, things that we've either got and that we use, or things that we're looking at um, that are interesting to us and that you might find interesting. Whether it's a gift for you or someone you know who uh, is also a bit geeky and uh, and technical. So. Uh, Pete, do you want to do you want to kick off with uh, with your first thing that's caught your eye? Yeah, it's it's actually something that um, we we found or I saw when we were uh, in Florida recently hanging out with Rich and the Strategic Profits team. He has this really cool, for for one of a better term, a laptop stand, and it's, it's called the iCraze laptop stand. And the really cool thing about it is it's got sort of bendable legs, and I'm probably going to do a very horrible job. Of explaining this, but I definitely suggest everyone go and check it out because what the legs allow you to do is basically change the position and the angle and the style of this laptop stand on the fly. So if you're sitting on the couch, you can sort of uh, put it down so it's more of like a, an old school sort of little table that sits above your lap. If you are on a desk and you want to make it like a standing desk, you can actually adjust the legs so it actually gives you that extension so it's like a standing desk. You can put it on angles if you're lying in bed, you want to have that on a light, light angle. And it's really cool. It's just a very, very versatile, very, very cost-effective uh, laptop stand, which I thought was really cool. It's got some holes in the bottom, so it gives the ventilation for the laptop. Uh, and it's just very, very versatile. And I love that idea because I'm going, to, I'm going to start using one for, you know, whether I'm going to be in bed, on the couch, if I'm going to be outside on the, the patio at the new house here, sort of doing some work and stuff like that. So it, it's very, very flexible and looks really, really cool and, and fun and easy to use. Yeah, and just to, sorry to, to kind of point out for everybody, um, below this episode, we're going to have a list of everything that we talk about and links where you can go find out more about them um, in the show notes, either in uh, in iTunes or over on preneurmedia.tv. So, uh, so do check out that below. Don't worry about scribbling down uh, the, what we're talking about because we'll we'll give you a little a little list below the episode. So, yeah, great tip, Pete. And uh, a laptop stand is actually a very handy thing to have. And I did actually look at Rich's. It is uh, quite a... It, it's hard to describe, but, yeah, it kind of folds up and collapses and extends and does all kinds of interesting things, the uh, the iCraze laptop stand. Now, speaking of laptops, um, I haven't really talked about this because uh, we're not really a technology show, so I don't, I don't tend to go on too much about technology. But... Um, as, as part of the, the moving about that we've done this year, we've done an awful lot of travel, I invested in a new laptop. 
uh, and I I really took a bit of a, a bit of a risk on a recommendation of a couple of people, and I picked up a MacBook Air. Um, now, hopefully everybody by now realizes, but the majority of my work is media production. It's it's video and audio editing. Uh, and producing all kinds of screencasts, screen recordings, all kinds of what people would consider to be heavyweight work. And when I was looking at a laptop, I was always looking at the top end of the range, the, the kind of what people would consider the really expensive things, just to make sure that it would absolutely do the job. Well, I'm pleased to report that um, I've basically moved away from my desk mach desktop machine, and even right now, even though I'm set at my desk, in my home office, I've got my my huge iMac on the desk in front of me, but it's actually switched off. I'm recording the podcast on my MacBook Air, and I've basically been working full time for the last mm, four or five months now on just on a MacBook Air, and it does absolutely everything that I want it to. Well, let me ask you this, mate, because like from from my perspective, you obviously know how I work and, and my workflow because we do so much together and. We spent a fair bit of time uh, hanging out in Florida the last six months. What's your take? Because the last two laptops I've bought have been my MacBook Pro, and I have literally gone and, pardon the pun, macked them out in terms of, you know, gone and customized it with the best of everything the top of the line screen, the biggest hard drive, the most RAM, and, you know, it's, it's like a five and a half grand or five grand investment for the, the MacBook Pros I've bought historically. And this one I've got right now, I've had for probably. I'd say 18 months, and this is the reason I actually do spend five or so grand on my laptops historically is because I do run them into the ground before I turn them over. As much as people assume that you know I'm a techie and all that sort of stuff, you know, it's it's tools for me. So if, if the tool still works, I'm not going to replace it for the sake of replacing it. Like I still don't have an iPhone 5 because I cannot see any benefit in having an iPhone, iPhone 5 to my workflow in my life. So I'm not going to waste time investing in something like that. So my question for you is, when I replace this laptop, which is going to be in the next couple of months, would you suggest, based on my workflows, which is primarily just, primarily just web-based stuff, email, you know, using you know, uh, the Office suite and, or the Mac equivalent, obviously, uh, and then some, a fair bit of recording on screen flow, but not too much heavy editing, because obviously that's what you and the team do for me. What would your suggestion be? Would you suggest to, for me to go to an Air these days? Absolutely. Honestly, I, unless you are a media production professional, and bear in mind that includes me. Um, I mean, I, I literally produced. You know, you, we we worked on on Profit Hacks, the 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 product that we just developed with with Rich. We worked on that together, and I produced all of the media uh, between me and my team. We produced all the media for that product, and I used the air. That's what I used. I produced an entire video-based information product with an awful lot of videos, an awful lot of content, um, using all kinds of different software, um, all on the Air. The only thing I would say about the Air, and I would say this pretty much about any laptop anyway, um, I mean, this is an absolutely standard off-the-shelf one as well. It's not been upgraded in any way. I haven't even got more, more memory in it. Um, is I just bought a little, little external hard drive. Mm-hmm. And I keep all the files on that. That's just me being me, because I work on really big files. And that's the biggest complaint people have about MacBook Airs, is they think that the hard drives are a bit small. What's the biggest hard um, drive you can get, do you know? Uh, it's going to change. By the time you buy yours, it'll change again. Yep. Um, and we're getting into really technical, esoteric stuff. Trust me, it's not whatever it is, it's not worth it. Don't spend the money to upgrade the hard drive. Just get an, an external one. They're, they're dirt cheap. Fair um, enough. And and honestly, I reckon I can really strongly recommend the MacBook Air. It's not the cheapest Mac laptop you can buy, um, and if you want to get really really technical about it, you could argue the case for the new 13-inch MacBook Pro because uh, they're approximately the same price and approximately the same size and approximately the same weight. There's just you know. One does one kind of job a little bit better, and one does another kind of job a little bit better. But they're so close now, and this is this is basically the bottom of the range. Mm -hmm. um, this is why I'm bringing it up as a as a as a kind of a you know holiday gift guide, because I do think now that that the power for the average user and average to high end user is now at such a a reasonable rate. This concept of five thousand dollar investment in in hardware is going away. 
Because mm. the argument always has been is that, like, you know, if you're a hairdresser, you're going to obviously buy the sharper scissors because you use them every day. And look, my MacBook Pro literally gets a workout for, on average, I'd say, 12 hours a day of actual me in front of it working. Yes, people, I am a workaholic, mm-hmm. if you haven't realized mm-hmm. that already. Um, so between sort of, you know, look, I just travel with me everywhere. Like, it's, you know, I get up in the morning, it's what I work on at home before I head into the office. It's what I work on, obviously, for the the top day of the office and I'll come home and do another hour or so at night on it. Um, so probably on average it's between 10 and 12 hours of, of, of work every single day for 500, 600 days before I look at replacing it. So I've always gone for that sharpest uh, pair of scissors type approach and this is sort of where I'm now sort of thinking, well hang on, is it better to get like a cheaper MacBook Pro and burn it out in nine months and, and then upgrade again and sort of have that same investment over a 18 month period but just divide it by two machines rather than macking out one machine but this is it I mean the thing with MacBook Air is there's literally no moving parts mm. literally no moving parts there's nothing to wear out other than you know, there's, there's this, the, the possibility that if you really really hammer it hard and the fan kicks in there's the potential that you might you know blow a fan but seriously you're not going to wear these things out anymore um, and the great, I mean, honestly, one of the things I, I found, and it sounds a little bit, it sounds a little bit uh, fictitious, but it's not, it's the truth. I actually found that I had to keep checking my bag to make sure I'd pick the laptop up <laughs> because they're so light. You know, I mean, your MacBook Pro, I've picked it up. It's, it's a big chunk of metal. Yeah. It's, you not, know? It's, but, it's not light, but by any means. But for somebody that uses, that wants portability, that wants, you know, it's always there, it moves quickly, it's responsive. I can't recommend it enough. And I realize that there are some people listening to this thinking that it's all well and good for me to say this. Um, You know, it's still a lot of money to spend on a machine. But your point is really important and really valid. And that is that it's a tool. This is a tool to me. I didn't buy it because it's shiny and pretty. I bought it because it was the best tool for the job. And and the most cost-effective one as well. Mm. Um, And I'm going to get years of use out of this machine. I've already got, you know, five five months of more hours a day than you've put in on yours with actually harder work Mm. out of this laptop. As far as I'm concerned, this laptop paid for itself in about a month. Yeah. You know, and if you're doing this kind of work, or if if it's the dominant thing that you do, is is you know, as, as a knowledge worker or an information you know, manipulator or, or producer, this is your tool of the trade. Um, and it's not a lot of money to invest in a business when you when you spread it out across two or three years. And that's so, the key, it is. Because if you're a, a... Anybody who listens to this show, whether you're an online marketer or you own, own your small, small business and obviously you're working all day, one of the biggest tools for any business these days is their computer or their laptop. So you want to make sure you have the best tool to give you the most efficient and effective results you want. Otherwise, you're actually hampering okay. your business. Oh, and just one more thing, which is, which is, you know, you look at you look at a MacBook Air, and it's it may be two to three times the cost of the laptop that you're currently looking at in Best Buy or in your local supermarket or wherever. Okay, it may be that, but those things that they they sell in supermarkets, you really will need to buy what buy two or three of those in the lifetime of a machine that you spend the right amount of money on. Mm. They will die. They will fall apart. They are made of solid, you know, completely end-to-end of plastic. Um, you know, they, they're going to keel over. They're not going to be strong enough and beefy enough to do the jobs you want them to do. Yeah. Um, so when it, become, when it becomes a business decision, then choose, you know, an appropriate business level tool. Anyway, I think that's kind of a bit of enough soapbox on that one, I think, mate. <laughs> well, let me uh, um, throw out another one on, on my... Uh, gift guide recommendation list and that's the doxy scanner i think we've spoken about it here on the show before um and the really cool thing i love about my my doxy scanner is it's just a everyday scanner in terms of it's uh the, the downfall to be completely upfront about it is it only allows you to scan one page at a time so it doesn't allow you to do sort of oh, no. books or anything like that so it's a single sheet feeder which does have a, a few moments of frustration but for 99 percent of the scanning i do i'm scanning single page stuff and it's really, really cool. It's very portable. It's very light. It's designed to be taken with you anywhere you go. And the real killer bit about it is that if you get the um, iFi card, which is a little SD card that has Wi-Fi built into it somehow. I have no idea how it does it, but it's got like a, a 4 gig card with Wi-Fi. 
what it allows you to do is actually scan stuff into the Doxy and then it will automatically sync those files with your computer, whether it be PC or Mac, over Wi-Fi. So there's no cables required or having to remember to actually connect it up. You just literally have the Doxy running wherever it might be and you can get stuff scanned. And I think we've spoken about this before and I, I still love it. I still use it so often. I think this is a device that's so cheap that is a, a must-have for most sort of uh, entrepreneurs and, and marketers. So, what, I mean, what do you use it for? Why is it, why is it a great thing to have? Well, I, I think, you know, the, the whole paperless argument, um, I hope, is a little bit redundant these days. So hopefully most people have realized the benefits of going paperless in their, in their life. So I have everything scanned, you know, in terms of things that come in the mail that um, I need to keep or I want to keep that I, I can't get electronically. They get scanned and then get put into places like um, Evernote, which is obviously my um, preferred digital filing cabinet. And we can talk about that a little bit later if we've got time. Uh, but I just use it to scan everything from receipts to invoices to, to notes and also more importantly for swipe file stuff. So if I'm out and about, like when I obviously I took a number of plane trips across the back and back and forth across the country in my recent trip to the US, you know, between Rich's office and the Experts Industry Association event where I spoke and back to Florida and things like that, I was ripping stuff out of magazines and newspapers and the in flight mags that I thought was good marketing, that I thought was interesting to actually reread and things like that and I've now got them all torn out but I don't want to go down the old path of having my swipe file in an actual filing cabinet so I want my swipe file in a digital uh, storage device that I actually you know search for and things like that and that's where Evernote comes in. Cool I, mean, I, I, I kind of moved I used to have scanners all the time and I kind of moved away from it but I have to say I've seen you kind of using the Doxy. We talked about it way back when, when you first got it and you were really excited. Um, and you really do use it. And I found it, it is that, it, it's that paperless filing and it's, it's the, the paperless swipe file. I found myself, you know, you, you kind of, you, you've influenced me quite heavily with this and I've started collecting swipe stuff. And I, I do take, I mostly take photos with my mobile phone. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it's easy and quick, but a, a scanner makes a much better copy of whatever it is, whether it's a business card or an invoice or, or, or as you say, a page out of a magazine. So, and and looking at the the doxy on the on their site, you can see it's it, they're designed to fit in your bag. They're designed to go with you and to be convenient. And I do love that extra little techie bit of of having the wireless connectivity. Yeah, it's very, very With cool. that, uh, that iFi card, so that's pretty cool. And to me, um, I think a, uh, a good litmus test for awesome tech is something that you're still using regularly three weeks, three months, uh, six months, 12 months after your initial purchase. Because obviously when you buy some new tech, it's so super exciting and you play with it and waste time with it for the first couple of weeks. But if you're still actually going back to that piece of tech and using it, um, quite regularly, three months after, I think that says a lot about the actual efficiencies and effectiveness of the device. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, just to kind of segue neatly across to to my next little piece of kit, um, I said when I got my MacBook Air that the first thing I did was got a little external hard drive. The other thing that I did get, and this is my this is my secret weapon. This is the thing that for me makes the MacBook Air the capable of doing everything that I want it to do. Because my one concern wasn't the day-to-day -day functionality, you know, being able to use all the different programs like Microsoft Office and also the screen capture activities and podcasting and things like that. But it was, it was the output because that's what usually kind of hammers the machine. It's what slows the machine down or brings it to its knees and takes a long time. Whenever you've produced any kind of video, um, and I, I can't remember if I've mentioned this before, but I really do think that this is the kind of the media producer's secret weapon. And it's a little thing. It only works on a Mac, and I'm very sorry if people are sick of hearing me tell you that Macs are great, but I'm sorry they are. Um, it only works on a Mac, and it's by a company called Elgato. And it's a little USB stick. Looks like a normal memory stick. Um, plugs in your USB port. And it's called the Turbo 264 HD. Doesn't get more technical sounding than that, does it? No, it's about um, as thick as it can get. It's about as technical as, as it can get. Now, try and follow along at home. But what this thing does is it's, it's literally got a little computer inside of it. And that computer is designed to do one job. 
and that is to take what you give it which is a hopefully a video file or the output from a, a program like iMovie or ScreenFlow which is what we use to record our screencasts it takes that information and it makes it into a proper kind of web ready video file of any description or an iPad ready video file or an iPod or iPhone size or whatever um, and it comes with it comes with its own software but it, it actually is its most powerful because it appears in the kind of export boxes of things like iMovie and ScreenFlow. So where I would normally go to ScreenFlow and say, right, okay, I've edited my screencast, I've added all the bits and bobs and got all the clever bits done, I want to make a file now that I can put on the web or put on my iPad or whatever. And normally I would press go and let's say it's a 10 minute recording. I could wait anything up to four times that for the file to come out the other end. And what this little stick does, if you plug it in, is instead of a normal export that you do, you press go and tell it to go to the stick and it literally zooms out these files. It's amazing. And when we're, calling, so, when we're talking about a stick, it looks like one of those little USB stick memory cards you get if you plug into your that's USB drive. Exactly. It, is tiny. It, it's, it literally looks exactly like a memory stick USB memory stick, whatever you want to call it, memory key, memory stick. Um, it sticks in your USB port on your Mac, any Mac, um, and it literally just takes the pressure off the, the kind of main computer when you're exporting video. Um, and what one side benefit of having this um, is that if you've got something like, for example, you know, I was traveling uh, and I wanted to load up my iPad, with uh, with with videos, um, which they needed converting, um, the software that comes with it is pre-built. You just literally grab any old file and drop it on the software, on its own, and uh, it, it'll turn them into iPad ready or iPod ready files, just just like that. It's just such a fantastic piece of kit, and it's so so cheap. It's ridiculously cheap for what it does, and the the improvement it gives you, the speed improvement. And it's, as I say, the, the secret here is it's my secret weapon. It's what makes the MacBook Air functional, fully functional, as a production unit for me. The Air itself on its own is fine and, and great for editing and doing all the day-to-day the -day stuff that I need to do, right the way up to that export point. But the export was always going to be a sticking point for me because that's where the real power of the computer is needed. Um, so this little Elgato Turbo Stick um, just literally takes that worry away. I plug it in, press export, and zoom, the files are exported in no time at all. It's amazing. Yeah, it's a great little piece of hardware that's... Uh a must-have if you're going to have a MacBook Air. I think it's it's very very cool. I, but obviously only if you're doing video editing on a regular basis. You can obviously always render out and edit video on the MacBook Air anyway. But it's just not going yep. to be as fast or as efficient if you're doing it on a regular basis as it would with a That's with it. Elgato. You know, if you're doing if you're doing one thing one thing a week or you know you do the odd occasional thing, then just leave the machine running while you go for your dinner or whatever. It's fine. But you know the amount of stuff that I produce, this literally probably. Well, it saved me days, literally days, in in waiting time, yep. um, and it also means that I can use the computer while it's doing that as well. Which so, very cool. great little tip. Awesome. My next one is a uh, a real quick and easy one. There, it's a pair of headphones, and they're called bed phones, as in like sleep bed bed phones. And what they are is they're a set of headphones that are designed to be flat. So the whole idea is you can wear them lying in bed and you can fall asleep to an audio book or a podcast. Now, you know, historically, um, of uh, what's the word I should use? I've inflicted Dan Kennedy and uh, various others t onto uh, my beautiful wife Fleur over the years um, with just playing them through a thing like a jam box or something like that, like just on the loudspeaker. And she now knows a lot of these guys by voice and never actually met them. Uh, but obviously with the baby coming along now in a couple of weeks' time and, and Fleur needing to be able to sleep better at night with the, with the bub in the tub, tummy and stuff like that. I've uh, been sort of forced, so to speak, to actually uh, not listen to these stuff on, um, on in, in loudspeaker mode. So bed phones have been great. They're very, very comfortable. You just whip them over your ears and they're designed to be flat. So you can lay on, the, on your side uh, on the pillow and not actually have that sore ear thing. I think anybody who's tried to sort of use a normal 
you know, iPhone or iPod um, headphones or any sort of general headphones lying in bed, it just doesn't work. It's just not comfortable. You can't get that enjoyment out of it. So these bed phones have been designed solely to sort of overcome that problem and they're very, very cost effective, um, but I've found them absolutely awesome. So if you're the type of person like me who, who likes to or would like to fall asleep and lie in bed at night and just you know listen to a, a podcast episode like this or a, an audio book from Audible or something like that, uh, bed phones are a, an awesome, awesome uh, cheap little tool or hack, so to speak, to be able to give you that outcome in a, in a comfortable way. So that's my really down and dirty quick gift suggestion for 2012. Cool. I, and the first time you told me about those, actually, I thought you were joking. I really <laughs> did. And then I went and looked them up, and they're really cool. It's a really clever idea. Because mm. um, you, you, you know, doing what I do, uh, I, I spend a lot of time listening listening to audio. Um, and, and obviously, I've picked up the, the kind of the audio book bug from you. But I have a slightly different recommendation on the headphone front okay. um, for just coming from where I come from, which is um, I really, I, I literally live with a pair of uh, headphones by a company called Shure. Now, if you have anything to do with audio and, and the, the music industry specifically, you might have heard of Shure, um, S-H-U-R-E. They're the people that make a lot of equipment for the music industry, like microphones and, and earpieces. Like you see when a professional musician's on the stage and they have that thing that like basically blocks up their ear so that they can hear themselves while they're on stage and they can't hear everything else. And the headphones that I use are kind of a variant of that. They, they have these little squishy earplug type attachments on them that goes in your ear and it's, it's an acquired taste don't get me wrong you know my my girlfriend doesn't like them at all um, but the great thing is that when I put these in I literally cannot hear anything at all outside um, so unless it's a really loud noise or it's causing a vibration so the great thing there is that I can have the actual sound on really really low so I don't have to put the sound up to overcome any outside noise so if I'm working remotely if I'm in someone's office like we worked in Rich's office extensively over the last month you know it was great for me not to have to find a special place to sit and work I just put these headphones in and uh, and I was awake although I did miss a few opportunities where people asked me if I wanted a cup of coffee and I didn't hear them um, but uh, the other benefit of these is that when you're on a plane, you know people use those like really expensive noise cancelling headphones on planes. Um, they do work, they're great, but they're expensive. Um, I just put these in, and it has exactly the same effect. I can't hear that kind of background hum that you get on the plane um, because it's blocked out by these things sealed in my ears. So they're just they are absolutely fantastic. They're not cheap. Don't get me wrong, they're not cheap, um, but they last forever. Um, and they, as I say, I mean, again, it's that thing. If you if you use something every day, then you really should, you know, pay the money and get the best that you can. And this is again part of my work. Um, and tax yeah, deduction. I, I, all, sorry. What? Tax tax deduction. Not going to be financial <laughs> advice, but <laughs> use it for work. It should be a tax deduction if you ask your accountant nicely. <laughs> Yeah, that that we may not, we may edit that out of the holiday gift guide. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on. <laughs> what else you got for us, MP? Ah, uh, look, something, something big, I'm going old school. I'm going to go old Are school you? here and, and not talk about anything new. I'm going to go way back in time, way way back in time, and talk about the iPod Nanos. Uh, this is something that I love. Like, this is a pet peeve of mine. I really find it frustrating when I'm out running and seeing people running with their iPhones strapped to their arm and one of those sort of... Uh, that is so funny to just, see that. I, I get it and yeah. I can understand it and yes, it gives you your tracking and stuff like that if you're using the app, but oh, that would frustrate the heck out of me trying to run with one of those things in my arm. It just would be so, so uncomfortable. Um, so, you know, I've got my um, Nike Plus watch which does my GPS stuff on me and obviously, you know, because of the Iron Man stuff I do, obviously, you know, that sort of level of of technology in that area works well for me but you know I really do believe that anybody who's trying to get fit um, whether it's just walking doing a catch to 5k type approach or training for a marathon or an Ironman or something like that an iPod Nano is by far the best thing you can invest in because I run with a visor so I sort of one of those sort of you know baseball caps without the actual headpiece the visor thing that goes around and I literally just have a pair of headphones that go in my ears with a really short cord 
and then actually attach my Nano to the back of my visor. So it's not actually on my body anywhere. It just sits and attaches to the actual um, back elastic piece of my visor. I don't even know it's there. And it's so out of the way and so comfortable, um, which is really, really important for me when I'm running. You don't want sort of weight and cables all annoying me and stuff like that. Um, but obviously what that means is I can devour podcasts, audio books, and things like that whilst I'm out running, which is really, really cool. That's good. That's a good tip because it's like a, a specific device for that job. They're really not expensive. Mm. They are, as you say, very discreet, very easy to just leave attached to your gear if you use if you use that technique that you've got there with that that visor, and you just load it up with whatever it is that you're listening to. Because one of the things I find is um, that I I I have a separate iPod um, because I didn't have an iPhone for the longest time. Um, I have an old, very old iPod Touch. But one of the things I found was that I would be listening to, let's say, an audio book while I'm out walking, and then at some of the juncture, I put some music on. Yeah. Um, and the whole thing just gets a bit mixed up. Just, you know, I, I don't know, can't remember where I was, what I was listening to, what I was doing. And so if you can, if what you do when you're out exercising is listen to audio books and podcasts and things, if you just load it, load it up, then away you go. You know, you just have that's that's the the, the device for the job. It sounds a little bit, I suppose, it's a little bit elitist to but have. This is this is a, this is a really cool thing too. And this is nothing to do with the nano directly. This is just a small little hack that I think um, has worked exceptionally well for me. Not that I necessarily needed the motivation, but for other people, I know this works really really well. And think about this: if you have a good book that you're really getting into, whether it's fiction or non-fiction. You know, it's hard to put down. You want to get back to the. I know, I know a lot of the uh, the ladies of the moment um, couldn't put Fifty Shades of Grey down. They'd read a couple of chapters in every spare moment. They want to read the next bit, and that's great. But think about that if you apply that as a positive constraint to getting fit. You go out for a walk and you listen to the first three chapters of a book. Hypothetically, if you force yourself with a positive constraint to only go back out and listen to that next part of the book while you're walking. It's going to actually force you to get out again, off the couch and exercising, which I think is a really, really cool uh, little positive constraint you can use to actually entice you to get out there and get fit. Cool. I, I like that. Um, it, it's all about, we, we have talked about this before. You know, we talked about making sure that, that there's less friction. Whatever it is you want to achieve, remove the friction. Um, and, and so coupling those two things together, putting something that you're interested in on your little iPod Nano um, and having it easy and accessible and ready to go, I think is a, a great little hack. Hmm. So yeah, that's my little uh, slight hack for today. Yeah, look at you. What about you, mate? What's next on your uh, wish list from Santa Claus? Well, it, it's something that, that I know a lot of people have got um, and I've, I've danced around this for, for various, both both business and home reasons, but I think this year is a year that I get an Apple TV. Hey! Um, and what did it, um, well, twofold, twofold. One of them is, um, you know, we live we live uh, out in the sticks, and um, so I'm a bit behind the times with, with modern television and, and modern shows and things like that. Um, so... Being able to access those online resources for 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 TV and films and things is is, is becoming a bit of an issue for us. Um, and the Apple TV is a great platform for that. But the other thing that, from a business point of view, I was really interested in in the opportunity that's that's there now with the newer platforms, the newer iPods and iPhones and iPads and things, is this idea of air sharing. Mm. And the idea that basically you've got a box that will plug into any television and once it's plugged in, it will receive a signal from your phone or your, your iPad or whatever and it will display your iPad screen on the television. Now, from a demonstration point of view, um, for any business really, that's fantastic. You know, the iPad has, at, at, at the most basic level, the iPad has a, a version of Keynote, which is like PowerPoint. Um, on it, so you can create entire presentations and give them on on your iPad. But you've also got video, you've also got photos. Imagine if you were a photographer 
and in your photography studio, if you wanted, you had a you had people in the, in the room, and you were kind of flicking through the shots of, of of your shoot on your iPad, and somebody said, "Oh, I like that one." Imagine you could just press a button, and it popped up on a huge flat screen TV. Mm. You know, a, a flat screen TV and an, and a, an Apple Apple TV connected to it actually is not a big investment of money for a business to have that kind of impact. Very true. Um, so I'm I'm really interested in that the, the kind of extended opportunities, but just just from a, a kind of a central media hub in the house point of view, I'm, I think it's I think it's way past time. You know, you talk about going back in time with your iPod Nano, but Apple TVs have been around a really long time, and um, I think it's way past time that I got one. Yeah, I actually found my first generation one when we were moving recently. But um, as a quick sort of another little hack for the Australian listeners. Uh, obviously, Hulu and um, Netflix um, aren't easily accessible for Australian residents uh, and people with a quote-unquote Australian IP address. Um, but if you check out a service called Unblock US, I think it's just at unblock-us.com, I think. Just Google Unblock US and it'll come up. Uh, they have ways and services and solutions to allow uh, people of various countries to access US-based content. So you can actually subscribe to Hulu uh, for $8 a month and you can subscribe to Netflix for $8 a month and get all the American TV shows and movies and services like that coming straight to your Apple TV. So it's a uh, very, very easy way to actually get amazing value content. Um, coming in, so that's a bit of a, a, a secret for anyone who's sort of, I know definitely Australians and I'm not quite sure what it's like in the UK or Spain and stuff like that, accessing US based content, but uh, that is definitely a really cool little hack That might be something that I may need to look at, actually, thank you for that <laughs> no sweat. No You are no a mine of useful information, sir. I do have my moments I do have mm -hmm. my moments So, my other thing I want to just touch on which is something that um, is actually on my wish list, you've just spoken about you know the Apple TV being on your uh, wish list and hopefully I've been a good little boy this year and I'm keen to check out the Fitbits. These are the new sort of fitness tracking devices. There's a lot out there these days. Nike have theirs and um, Jawbone have theirs uh, and there's been a few other ones released in recent times. And these are sort of like the, you know, the wristband type approaches to fitness and things like that. It, it intrigues me because the whole idea is you wear this little wristband thing and it tells you when you're sleeping and how much exercise you're doing and all that sort of stuff. And it, the whole science behind it is intriguing me more so than anything else because I quite can't, I, I can't quite understand how something on my wrist will tell me when I'm asleep and when I'm awake and when I'm running and when I'm walking and how much calories I'm burning and all that sort of stuff. So that's going to be a, a really cool thing that, that I, um, I want to check out in, in, in 2013. So that's on my wish list. It's, uh, yeah, it's yeah, you got it. To, Ad admit it, admit it. You, it's the competition side of it as well, because you can with the Fitbits and things like that. You can you can go online and go look at my score, look what I've done. You can, you can. There is an ego part to it as well, because yeah. obviously you can uh, social network it out the wazoo and um, have you know little contests with your friends and stuff of who's burning the most calories and who's doing the most exercise and all that sort of stuff. But the, the, the half the problem with that is that you know half my friends are in that sort of Ironman triathlon space and and a little bit more obsessed than I have. So in that scenario, I'll be down the bottom, but at least with my nerdy business friends, I'll hopefully be at the top of that list. So, so to make sure <laughs> which, which social network I connect to it. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't really need a device to tell me that I sit at a desk too long each day <laughs> right now. But um, yeah, I, I, like, I'm, I too am intrigued by the technology of those things. I think uh, it's, a great, it's a great idea, um, and I'll, I'll wait till you've got one. And, yeah. and we'll we'll work it out with with you because there's no point as I say no point attaching it to me it'll get very confused. So we're kind of you know coming up on on time a little bit. Should we just do a bit of a, a rapid fire round with really quick reasons why for the remainder of our uh, wish lists? Because obviously yeah, let, let's go ahead. I was going to say given the type of people we are, our wish lists obviously always exceed uh, <laughs> what is required for time or available. So uh, let's sort of do a bit of a rapid fire thing. So what's your next one? All right. Well. I'm, I'm actually going to I'm actually going to kind of cram a couple of things together, um, just to wrap up this this kind of hardware and technology section. Okay. Um, because you you mentioned on your wish list and on my wish list, um, nobody will be surprised to know is a camera, um, and it's the Panasonic have just released a new GH3. Now I I bought a GH2 um, earlier in the year. It's a what looks like a regular camera. 
um, but it in fact shoots high definition video. And the GH3 is a phenomenal upgrade. Anybody that's interested in producing high quality, high definition video at a very, very reasonable cost should definitely look at the GH3. Speaking of upgrades, um, the other thing that has just been released, you may remember us talking briefly in the past, um, and anybody that knows us will know we, we love our live scribe pens, the pen that will kind of t take a digital copy of your real world handwriting and also record audio at the same time. They've just upgraded that to have a Wi Fi connection, so you no longer need to actually connect this thing with a cable to your computer to download the recordings, which, which I think is a great, cool. great improvement. And the last bit of tech, this is this is kind of and oh, if there? you were I'm here. Hello. Hello. Oh, yeah, maybe a bit weird. Am I back? Yeah. Okay. And the last bit of tech, this is my kind of if if you were gonna get yourself one thing from a product productivity improvement point of view this year, treat yourself or get get your family to get you something or whatever. It's a very simple thing. It's a second monitor for your computer. Um, it, whenever you're working on a computer, if you work all day long on a computer, then you'll find, however big your screen is, very often you'll, you'll run out of space, um, especially if you're producing any kind of information um, or working with a lot of websites or web pages or doing research or anything like that. And when I first heard this tip, I, I didn't believe it, but trust me, I tried it. I didn't spend a lot of money on my second screen um, and it, it's just the same size as my main screen just sits to the side and I can just have just double the information available to me at the same time now I don't recommend that you use it to stick your Twitter feed on because that's just <laughs> distracting um, but it, it is a great productivity improvement and once I think once you try it then you won't go back so that would be my number one thing from a productivity point of view Pete, have you, have you got anything you want to kind of squeeze into the end of the show? Yeah, well, there's probably, you know, two services that I think, you know, we kind of touched on one of them before, and that's Evernote. Like, I now use Evernote on a very, very regular basis between the, the actual application, but also the web clipper, because, you know, with that mindset, I know we've spoken about before on the, the note-taking show, I think it might have been from memory, um, which was way back at the start of the, um, the series of shows we've done, and it's definitely one of the better ones, so hopefully people... Go back and check that one out. We, we talk about and we break down different tools for note taking and, and management of your data. And I think Evernote is best looked at when looked at as a filing cabinet. I don't use it as a note taker, so to speak, or as anywhere sort of for planning and things like that. I use it as a virtual filing cabinet. And I just clip and add so much stuff into Evernote because it's searchable, it's taggable. Uh, and I think an Evernote Pro subscription is a, a must have in this day and age. That's a service that I recommend people check out. And the other one is our, you know, Old Faithful uh, Audible, which we talk about quite regularly. They're, you know, a regular sponsor of the show and you can get a free trial at, you know, audibletrial.com forward slash preneurcast. If you haven't tried it out, you can get a free uh, audio book to, to try this stuff out on. Uh, but really, you know, I'm, you know, getting two to three audio books a, a month from their service and it is fantastic. It's a great way to get information, particularly if you're commuting or traveling or running or doing exercise and things like that. I uh, highly, highly recommend uh, Audible as a service. And I completely agree with you on both of those. I'm a massive user of Evernote. I don't think a day has gone by in the last six months that I haven't used a web clipper, just like you. Um, and again, I use it as a mostly as a file filing cabinet, a way of storing things in a central place. And it's great because I can get it get at it again on my iPad, my iPhone, on all my desktops, it's all shared between the two. Uh, so, awesome. My my other kind of piece of software, the thing that, that again, is, is a significant improvement in my world, uh, ScreenFlow, the screen recording software that both you and I use, they've just upgraded to version 4. And if you are, if you've not, if you are a Mac user, because it's only Mac software, um, and you have any need or any idea that you might want to record your screen, ScreenFlow is pretty much the best in class. And the version 4 has just been a phenomenal upgrade. Definitely worth looking into. Um, and my final, final tip, which is actually a double-purpose holiday season tip for a service, 
is if you if you use Amazon at all, if you buy anything from Amazon, and well, you can literally buy anything from Amazon. Um, I strongly recommend that you look into investing in an Amazon Prime subscription. Now you have to be based in the US, though, right? Nope, not at all. Amazon Prime is available in all of the major Amazon locations. I have Amazon Prime on my UK account. Yeah, but us Australians, no luck yet. Uh, well, you haven't got Amazon, so, you know. There are rumours. There are, have been some pretty strong rumours that they've been out here looking at warehouse space, which is very exciting. But, and th this, is, this is actually, this is, valid, this is a valid tip for you, even though you are an Australian. Um, and, and it's for this reason. This is why it's a holiday season tip. If you have customers or friends and family in another country, um, it's well worth getting an Amazon account in that country and getting Amazon Prime. Because Amazon Prime is a very, very low cost and it allows you to get free shipping for any number of goods, whether it's a single order of a single book all the way up to a huge order. And if you believe, as Pete and I do, in giving back to your client base by sending them little gifts from time to time, whether it, you know you might send people a recommended book, or you might you know send it send it to a colleague, or send it to a business acquaintance, or send it to your clients, or whatever it might be, or you might just want to send gifts to friends and family overseas. We do because we're in Spain. We do all of our Christmas shopping on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, so they do we, gift wrapping. They do gift wrapping. Very cool. So we literally ship all of our Christmas presents and birthday presents to all of our friends and family in the UK via Amazon. And we don't pay a penny for the shipping. It, nice. it is it's such a, a, an efficiency. It's amazing. And as I say, you know, for those of you who have a, a large customer base or client base in, in a country like the UK or in the USA, um, if you want to be shipping things from Amazon, if it's, a, if it's practical for your business model, uh, then Amazon Prime can save you an absolute fortune. I will give a bit of a caveat on that, though, unfortunately, is that uh, if you're going to do some crazy numbers of shipping, like you're going to ship you know, 300 items in, in one week to 300 different addresses, they do have mm. a fair use policy and they will send you an email. Okay. Um, I won't ask how you found that out, but I will take your, I'll take your word on that. But within reason, you have no issue at all. Just uh, don't go thinking you can go and send out a thousand gift hampers to your thousand clients in one week and not get uh, an a, a inquisitive email from the, uh, the customer service team. And on that note, <laughs> <laughs> so folks, that's kind of our, our tips for a holiday gift guide, slightly technically and business oriented, um, but hopefully there's something in there for everybody, a little bit of everything for all pockets and price ranges. Um, and you know, a mixture of things that we, we ourselves are using or that we're looking forward to, to kind of getting in our holiday gift collection ourselves. That's um, it. Yeah, that's, cool. us, that's us for this week, folks. Back to normal programming next week, but uh, wishing you all a great holiday season. Thanks for listening in. Uh, please keep the comments coming, both on iTunes and preneurmedia.tv. Um, obviously, as we said at the beginning, we'll have a list of all the things that we talked about this week in the show notes on preneurmedia.tv with links so you can find out more about them and uh, speak to you all next week see you guys you've been enjoying another fine episode of Printercast with Pete Williams and Dom Gocher make sure to hang out with the boys online at printermedia.tv or drop them a line via Printercast at printergroup.com <laughs>